unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Second Samuel chapter 7. In Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 18, he says, Then went King David in and sat before the Lord. This was David going before God. Okay, He went and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? He said, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? Who am I? He's saying, who am I, O Lord? You know, who am I, O Lord? And what is my house, he says, that thou hast brought me hither to? And the next verse says, and this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou, the Bible says, hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and is this the manner of man O oh lord and that's why i really want to make our main emphasis tonight for the sermon he says and this was yet a small thing in thy sight O oh god but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come and is this the manner of man O oh lord is this the way you deal with all men in the niv he says and if this were not enough for your sight O sovereign lord you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant he says is this your usual way of dealing with man or sovereign lord that's a very fundamental question in the faith the very fundamental question in the faith of course considering david the servant of the lord a man the bible says who had the heart of god okay a man after God's heart, you know, but the literal translation from the Hebrew, a man with the heart of God. Okay? With the heart of God. It's a very deep thought to understand it. But when you do, it is a very liberating experience to know that this man is a man who existed in life and had the heart of God. He had the heart of God. And so David, the Bible says one of those days he goes in communion with God. He seeks before God. Okay? As it was, you know, the life of men who know God. At a particular point, we have to have experiences that separate us. You know, every believer must have experiences that separate you. To just be alone with God. To just be alone with God. Because many of us are with a lot of things. We are with a lot of people. Sometimes we are with a lot of gadgets. You know, some of us spend more time on our phones. And that's okay, but create time as an individual. You know, to have time with God. And that's what David had. He had a moment, you know, with God. An intimate experience with God. And so as he goes there, you know, he says, thank you. You know, he's with gratitude, you know. And on a matter that seemed simple but was deep to the heart of David, he makes a very defining statement. He says, thank you because you were kind and loving enough to speak into the future of the household of your servant he says and then he says is this your usual way of dealing with man or sovereign lord do you deal with everyone this way do you deal with everyone this way or do you just love me david but do you deal with every man this way and that's a good question that's a very 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 good question to ask because people go through too much people go through too much you know, my active years of ministry, I have sat and heard stories after stories, you know, pains after pains, you know, frustrations after frustrations, dismays, frustrations. You know, you might think you're going through much until you meet somebody who is going through even worse than you are going through. People are going through things in the world. And believers, you know, the world and believers, you know, they go through a lot, okay? And then sometimes the things around them cannot ascertain anything in the future. They don't spell any light of prospect for what might happen tomorrow. It's probably somebody right now who doesn't know 
what they're going to be next week, what they're going to be next year, what's going to happen next month, what is going to happen next week, what is going to happen next year, what is going to happen? How am I next 10 years going to be with my children? How am I next five years going to be in my marriage? How am I next 10 years going to be in my career? How are the next 15 years going to be in my body, in my health? You know, sometimes if I'm feeling like this now, how am I going to be in the next 10, 15 months or 20 years from now? You understand? So yes, people go through much and then we become so anxious about tomorrow. We become so anxious about next week. We become so anxious about next year. And now we see a man, okay, David. And David is telling you, look, Father God thank you. Because you found it worthy in your own grace and mercies have been generous to your servant that you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And then he says, is this your usual way of dealing with man O oh, sovereign lord do you do this usually okay and so david knows that there has to be a uniqueness about this but also deeply than that he has a certain gratitude okay he has a certain gratitude that is why you hear him say who am i who am i this is david who am i you know it's hard to understand when david says who am i more so for people who are a new creation who say, oh, you know, I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm that, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that. Yes. But you see, you must also go back into the experience of where these men speak the word, who am I? To fully understand and appreciate it. To fully understand and appreciate it. And I think the more grace is revealed to your spirit, the more you understand. Okay? There are many experiences in the presence of God, in that beauty, you know, of his presence and I'm like oh God you chose me you chose me there were many but you chose me you know I was not the wisest but you chose me I was not the strongest but you chose me I did not come from the greatest family there was in the world but you chose me I was probably not the most perfect and probably that people who sought you a certain way and deserved, but you chose me, you know? That experience happens when you see and experience God deeply. That awakening comes when a man experiences God deeply, and man will never understand it until they have experienced God deeply, okay? That is why I believe that self-righteousness, all right, when people speak of self-righteousness, self-exaltation, that whole self of I'm the one who did this, I'm the one who did this, this would not have happened if it was not me. I have come to the understanding that everywhere you see a self-righteous man is where you'll find a man who has not really experienced God deeply. A man who has not really experienced God deeply. Deeply, and I mean deeply. Because when you experience God, when the ability of God comes in contact with your inability, when the sustainability of God comes with your human, you know, insufficiency, when the power of God comes and encounters your human weakness, you know, when the wisdom of God comes and encounters your kind of thought, there's something that blows your spirit to humility. And that, you know, speaks your understanding in knowing that it could not have been you. It humbles. And I've read through scripture, I've read through history, and I've seen many experiences of men of God, ministers of God, who have experienced that encounter. And they say, who am I? Like David. They say, who am I? Like David. I'll give you a few examples. When God is commissioning Moses into the call of ministry, into the call of the responsibility, in Exodus 3 verses 11, the Bible says, and Moses said, to God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He's saying, who am I? And you know, some people say, ah, no, no, come on, Moses, please, don't bore God. You already know you know nothing, but can we skip that? Can we just go to the point of where you're supposed to go rescue the nation? Listen, don't take it lightly. Why Moses spoke this word? Why Moses spoke this word? He looked at the responsibility of redeeming a whole nation. 
and looked at the stead of himself. He did not have the Anne Egypt had. He did not have the splendor, the grandeur of beauty that Egypt had. He did not have the institutions that Egypt had. He did not have the influence that Egypt had. He did not have the authority that Pharaoh had. More so, he was already at odds with the kingdom. Okay? He had not lived the most perfect life of a Jew. Remember, he was raised as an Egyptian. He was trained in the way of the Egyptians. The Bible says he learned the language of the Egyptians and he esteemed the wisdom of the Egyptians, meaning that partly some of the Egyptian mythology is demonic. He could have probably also embraced some of that stuff. It's probable. Because he was raised in the palace, what more did he know? Now, he's looking at himself, at God encountering him at a very mature age when he has not lived the life he ought to have lived and he sees the task ahead of him and then he says, who am I, O oh God? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? You know, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. This is a man comparing himself on the task that God has laid upon him, okay? We go to Gideon in Judges 6.15, the Amplified. He says, O oh Lord, how can I deliver Israel? He says, Behold, my clan is the poorest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You know, the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. This is a man looking at his inability. He understands that without God, he's nothing. He knows that this task is too big for his ability. He can count, you know, all his successes and graces. And he knows this was never in his rank. This was never in his ability to do. We go to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 21. He said, And Saul said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? He says, And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then thou speakest thou so to me? As in, why do you come to me? Why do you speak to me? Why are you taking time to speak to me? Of course, like I said, some people say, oh, no, 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 that's self-righteous, so shouldn't he speak to you? No. Don't miss the point here. Understand that something happens to a man when God finally encounters them and shows them, I'm going to use you for something bigger than you, bigger than your ability, bigger than your wisdom, bigger than your finances, bigger than your color, bigger than your tribe bigger when you start to see that you start to ask oh you understand what i'm saying it was a statement of humility it wasn't a statement of ignorance no it was a statement of confusion at the hour when god had encountered this man you understand and then paul as well in ephesians chapter 3 he says and to whom am less than the least of all saints was this grace given unto me that i should preach unto the gentiles the unsearchable riches of christ you know, he still knows that of the people God would have chosen to use to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, Paul knew. Persecuted the church. He was there at the stoning of Stephanus. He supported it. He was arresting men. The Bible says uh, he zealously persecuted the church and protected the way of Judaism. He went ahead of his peers in the other realm of darkness. He set himself against the cross. He says, I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ and wasted it. Now, if God, you were to use somebody, you would not have, oh God, you would not have used Paul. He would not have used Paul. That is why later the man tells in Corinthians, brethren, let us consider our calling. That is the thing that should always humble you. Every time you want to feel exalted, you know, I see men of God who have now become God. Huh? They've become like God. They want to be worshipped. They even want the very ground they sit to be, you know, carried in the air. But man of God, who were you? Who were you? Who were you? I see men who, when they get anointed, they create this whole atmosphere around them. They create this whole, you know, glory around them, a kind of falsification of a picture of glory in the world, but that 
befits not the way of the master. Who were you before God called you? What were you doing before God called you? Were you the most righteous? Were you the wisest? Were you... No. Reverend, he said, see your calling. He says, not many were wise after the flesh. Not many were mighty. Not many were noble that are called. But the Bible says, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world. He says, to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. When a man understands 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, you will stay humble always every time you stand on the altar of Jesus Christ or every time you stand to represent that name because you'll always carry the consciousness in the spirit that it was never about you. It was never about you. Or oh, even of all saints, I believe God chose some of us because he knew how weak we were. He chose some of us because he knew how not wise we were according to the standards of the world. He chose us because he knew how imperfect we were according to the standards of the world. Every time I read that scripture, it humbles me to always stay sober. It reminds me that you were nothing now your son but you were nothing before you always have to relay your understanding in in why God chose you in why God chose you these are the things that break us in the presence of God these are the things that break us before God and and there's a brokenness only God and give a man. There's a brokenness only God can give you when you understand the calling with which you are called. Okay? That is why it's easy for a man who has encountered God a certain way to understand the gospel of grace. Very easy. Very, very easy. Very, very easy. I've had many experiences with my Lord, okay? And things that I would never substitute for any joy or happiness in the world because they have stayed suckered and some have chosen not to say until I'm very old later in life because of the nature of the things that I've seen with God. But the most sobering experience in God for me is that moment when he shows you all of this stuff and then he shows you just how incapable you are in the flesh to even do a fraction of the things he has showed you and then you hear the bowels of his mercy and grace pouring over your spirit and they are all seeing this one thing I love you and I want to use you. It's one of the most revealing experiences. You understand? And when a man experiences that kind of life, when a man sees those kinds of things, you start to treasure the presence. You stop entering the presence of God out of duty. You enter the presence of God in humility. Because you understand the divine privilege of being able to commune. It's like when we went through this COVID season where churches were closed. I know many people who have come to the appreciation of what it means to be in a fellowship with people. And yet some of those individuals probably would pray sometimes, sometimes they don't pray, sometimes they're attending service, sometimes they're not attending service. But some have never missed this live stream because now they understand the power 
and just how much important it is and the liberty that it takes to congregate because right now we don't have that liberty a virus has robbed the world of that liberty something small that needs to be seen through a microscope has robbed the world of that liberty it shall pass it shall pass and that i know for certain but the presence of god is something that for me has become the most remarkable experience of my life and it has become so cultivated that i don't need to lock my i do sometimes but i don't need to lock myself up to be with him even when i sit in my car for 10 minutes i can have an experience with god even if i just walk on the road for five minutes i can have an experience with god even if i'm just sitting in my living room two minutes are just enough to have a certain experience with god and how i wish that sometimes i would get this and share it with certain people to understand the riches of his glory the riches of his presence and what that does to your spirit because i have lived long enough to see that not many people are in this connection have plugged in that much and you can tell you can tell you can tell it is something about the glory and anointing that surrounds somebody who knows how to find god when they need him and that's the life that every believer i believe should have that's the life every believer i believe should have but back to the point david is saying who am i your lord okay who am i your lord but now it goes into the issue that i wanted to you know emphasize on tonight and it says that you have considered the future of your servant and spoken into the future of your servant and his household he's asking it's so good this is so beautiful is how you deal with all men is that the law touching men is it a principle that you speak into the future of men and there are many people who ask themselves that question every day and i'll tell you why you can tell by how much many people seek from other people to know their future you can tell you can tell just how many people are bleak about their future that they seek another man to tell them of their future i'm not against men speaking into the future of people i'm not talking about prophets speaking into the future of people but that should not be a place for one to seek for the new testament dispensation it should not be a place for one to seek it should be a place for god to bring to a man to a believer because it's necessary for god to deliver a word to you through a man of god but it shouldn't be the place for you to seek out oh god send a man to give me a word speak to my prophet about me speak to my apostle about me speak to my pastor about me or i pray that my pastor calls me out and gives me a word i pray that my prophet or my evangelist gives me a word in the old testament it was understandable there were three kinds of anointing there was a priestly uh, you know there was the kingly the judge so there were instances where you know men desired to hear from the prophet in that time and that's all right in the old testament dispensation but in the new testament dispensation the bible says in hebrews who god at sundry times in diverse manners spake unto our fathers through the prophets the Bible says he spoke unto our fathers by the prophets, by the prophets, okay? But that's to say, and has in these last days, all right, spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the eons, he made the world. Can you read that English word? The English says, has in these last days spoken. He has spoken he has spoken and to us by christ and so the new testament church is not supposed to be waiting for an apostle to give you a word specific touching the future of your marriage touching the future of your children touching the future of your business you understand if it comes praise god okay but it should come because god had to use him but not necessarily because it is the way of the master the way of the master now to the new testament church he speaks through and has spoken through the person of Jesus Christ. And so when you see a man seeking a prophet, seeking an apostle, seeking a man of God to know their future, 
That man is disconnected from Jesus. There's a disconnect from the person of Jesus. And I emphasize the word seeking, okay? I'm not against, you know, you sitting in a place and, you know, somehow God invites somebody to speak into your spirit. That's all right, okay? But there's that satisfaction of even if that person has not spoken on my life, even if that person has not prophesied anything on my life, the ultimate voice Christ has spoken, all right? So it is a bit deep to understand for some people, more so when you have been living in the realm of victim, if you've been living in the realm of disadvantage, you know, and so you are a seeker with lust, and you're not a seeker with divine hunger and understanding, you know, and revelation. And so David is saying, do you deal with this for some men or with all? Because there are people actually honestly who ask themselves that question, God, are you speaking to me? Do you speak in the future of every man? Or, you know, there are some special people like Apostle Grace and, you know, Evangelist so and Prophet so and Teacher so and, you know, special so and, but the rest of us, you know, are just supposed to be there. And then we wait for them to tell us what you are telling us about our future. And so, and some people think it that way. All right? Some people think it that way. This is the answer. It is the way of God to speak in the future all right, of his people in the New Testament dispensation. And this is general. It is general. More so in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, of course, he spoke the future of many. He was distinct with some, like David, Moses, Abraham, you know, Ezekiel, and the rest. He was distinct with some. But in the New Testament dispensation, that distinction is for every believer. God intends for you to know your future. He intends it. It is your right to know your future. Okay? And so what's the part of your prophet, your pastor, your apostle? To confirm it. If they confirm it, good. If they don't confirm it, it's still affirmed by God, by whom he speaks through Christ. All right? In Psalm 33, verses 10, the Amplified, he said, Thou, Lord, brings the counsel of the nations to naught or nothing, and he makes the thoughts and plans of people to no effect. And the next verse says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the thoughts of his heart through all generations. He's trying to give us something here. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the thoughts of his heart throughout all generations. He's saying, not only do I make counsel, all right, touching, you know, experience as an individual, but my counsel goes through all generations. In other words, I'm not just intending to speak into your future because you're born again now. No, but now that you're born again, as God, I intend to speak to your future, to your children who are not yet born, to your great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren to thousands of generations from now who are not yet born, who have not yet separated darkness and light, who are not an entity of existence, physical, right? But because I know who they are and how they are going to come and where they are going to come from, I don't just intend to speak into your future. I intend to speak to you and in the future of all the people that will come out of your lineage, out of your bosom, out of your loins. I intend to speak into the future of people coming after you thousands and thousands of years. Now you might not guarantee the salvation of your child who is not yet born or who is still young. But God said, because I have a relationship with you now, okay, my counsel spoken over you will extend even to those who are not yet born. That is why the Bible says, and for the children which were not born yet, it says that the calling of God might be sure. Okay? That the calling of God might be sure. He's speaking of an experience of the surety of his calling. For those that have not been born, for those that are probably just born right now, he's saying that because I called you and I elect you, I'm also speaking into the destiny of your children and your children's children. As for the children being not yet born either, having done any good or evil. So the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand not of works, he says, but unto him that calleth. You know, not of works, 
but unto him that calleth. He is speaking even into the future of the children that are not yet born. When you are a mother right now and you're looking at your sons in the living room, God has spoken over their lives, but he has also spoken over the wives they will marry. He has also spoken over the children they will have. He has spoken over the children's children's wives and daughters. So he's spoken over the, the husbands of your children. And that's the mentality. That's the consciousness that must arise in every believer that my future is stored by Christ. The only problem is, or challenge for many believers, is that they do not know how to pick, you know, the prophetic word of God touching their future in the wisdoms of the word. They do not know how to, you know, they don't carry that and hopefully one of those days I want to teach about spiritual blindness you know there are different you know realms of blindness in the spirit okay like for example the blindness the servant of Elisha had you know some of those carry certain blindnesses of that magnitude that people who carry a blindness in the understanding of the word that the word of God is veiled to them they read but they don't understand you know the Bible says having eyes they do not see having ears you know he said the Bible says they shall hear but not understand you know they shall see but not perceive some people are blind spiritually and some people are so blind even from these pages that are read in black and white to tell their future very distinctively because it almost looks like general it almost looks like it's for everyone it almost looks as though he has said that for you and he has said that for you and he has said that for the other and so all of us he has said it to us so god what is my distinctive message in lieu of what i'm reading it takes a special grace of designing and understanding you know a certain openness of your eye spiritually to carry your distinction in the total sum of words spoken by the person of jesus christ but yet he speaks even distinctly through us in the most general form, which is his word and is available for all men. But it takes a special grace to, you know, zero this down and carry the understanding until God starts to pan your future out and the message becomes so clear that by the time you start drawing your distinction on the prophetic word God has spoken to you or about you, watch this, it would be so distinct and personal that nobody can connect to it except you but yet it will be justified and easily proved through the word i hope you understood that i hope you understood that now in proverbs 24 verses 14 if you read from the amplified version he says so shall you know skillful and godly wisdom to be thus to your life. You see? He says, so shall you know skillful and godly wisdom to be thus to your life. And he says, if you find it, uh -huh, then there shall be a future. Are you following? He said, if you find skillful and godly wisdom, then you will know your future. And he says, and there shall be a future and a reward. Okay, and your hope, he says, and expectation shall not be cut short. Wow. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. This is something that the normal eye cannot easily find. These are scriptures that people will read, but the normal eye cannot easily find. It takes skillful and godly wisdom to pan out some of these realities okay to align and flood your future with light because the word of god is light the word of god is light from darkness to light but what is that entity that the lord will use to give the light of your future the word now he did not say if you find a prophet, there shall be a future and a reward for you. If you find an apostle, there shall be a future and a reward for you. If you find a pastor, there shall be a future and a reward for you. So if you don't find, or if the pastor or the prophet or the evangelist does not call you out, or does not know your name, or does not answer your phone call, or does not respond when you send them a text, so your future is gone. God doesn't love you enough 
oh God loves the other one whom they called out. How many people have they prophesied on to? And whatever was spoken on their lives, even by the most accurate people I know, has not come to pass and might not come to pass. Because there's a way of perception and reception of the word of God, the prophetic word spoken by God. It's not just enough that a man spoke this in your life and some of you even say, oh, that prophet is not a prophet because it did not come to pass. Sometimes it's deeper than that. Sometimes it's just how much you are aligned to understanding, to this wisdom. The prophet benefits those that carry skillful wisdom and godly wisdom. The apostle, the teacher, the pastor, they can only benefit you to the level where these foundation wisdom, the principal thing is in your spirit. And so to think that you're going to walk without godly wisdom and skill, but expect that because the word is spoken over your life and therefore it shall be so, is a misunderstanding of the will of the spirit. It says, my son, give me thine heart. And in giving mine heart, the reason why I want your whole heart to you is that your eyes will observe my ways is that your eyes will observe my ways. Because some people do not know the ways of the Spirit. When your heart is fully given to God, it's to the end that your eyes will observe the ways of the Spirit. Many people don't know the ways of the Spirit. And some of them are being taught by people who don't even have a clue of the ways or who have gone wayward in the ways of the Spirit. And so blind guides lead the blind. Okay, And one of the blindnesses comes through blind guides. Okay? that sometimes we listen or heed to people whose eyes don't see well. And to see, I'm not saying that I've seen your name or this is, no, 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 no. There's a deeper vision in God. And the depths of that wisdom is in the ways of God. It's in the wisdoms of God. Okay, it's in the wisdoms of God. And so blind guides leave the blind. And they all fall in the beach. Sometimes we are blind because some men are blind. Okay. So here, he's telling you that if you pursue godly wisdom, okay, if you pursue godly counsel, he says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to make you prosper, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future. Plans to give you that hope and that expected end. Thus I know. But now he has even gone further in Proverbs 24 to tell you how those thoughts come. They come by giving you skillful and godly wisdom it is when you find it i wish people know what to find because some of you are seeking for prophets apostles pastors you're seeking for men of god no 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 i wish you know exactly what to seek for god says if you find it he says then there shall be a future there shall be a future your future will be clear it shall be clear help your future Okay? And a reward. And it says, and your hope and expectation shall not be cut short. What is hope? Hope, the literal translation for the word hope, is the expectation of good. Expecting good. Your expectation of good. It will not be cut short. Your expectation shall not be cut short. That means whatever you expect to happen in the future will happen for you in the future. Praise God. But now he's saying, I have spoken through Christ. I have spoken through Christ has spoken through Jesus Christ. Having this last day spoken through Jesus Christ. That means no New Testament creature, new creation of whom all things are of God, okay, should be looking for an apostle to speak in their future. Should be looking for a prophet to speak in their future. Should be looking for a pastor to speak in their future. For an evangelist to speak in their future. No, but God will use prophets to speak into your future. God will use apostles to speak into your future. Pastors, men of God to speak into your future. But if he does, okay, it should not be your seeking. It should be his invitation. It should be his prompting. All right? Why? Because he has already spoken. And so if a prophet should come to speak into your life, or a man of God should come to speak into your life, we, as men of God, will only confirm what is already affirmed by Christ. And so there's nothing new. But what if we don't confirm it? It's still affirmed by the one he has appointed as heir. Okay? And one also which made the eons. You know, when God tells you that I have spoken by the Christ who created the ages, the eons, the periods of the spirit, the worlds of the spirit, 
have spoken by him touching your future. That is the most superior voice. Me, Apostle Grace, even if I prophesy in your life, I did not create eons, the world. The ages, I'm not talking about the cosmos, the physical realm, the physical world, I'm talking about the spirit world for which we all attain, you know, to pursue when we become born again. Because remember, all our blessings are spiritual. He says he has blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly presence of Christ. And God is saying, by Christ, I made those spiritual realms in which your spiritual blessings are. And by him also, I have spoken concerning your future. I've spoken concerning your future. And because I've spoken concerning your future, through the person of Jesus Christ, hello, hello. So any prophet or any pastor or any apostle or any man of God that comes to speak will be a confirmer of what already the person of Christ, okay, has spoken who created all the eons. So David asks, is this your way? For all mankind, is this the law that you speak into the future of the households of your servants? New Testament, for all believers, distinctively, 100%, yes. So your future is spoken of. That's all saying, oh, we don't know what's going to happen after this season. I know. I know what's going to happen. Oh, but who are you to tell the future? I know. Why? Because I carry the wisdom of God. I carry the wisdom of God. I have never claimed the office of the prophet. But if you go through the past, you'll see that the things I've spoken touching this nation, touching the world, have always been connected. I've always been accurate in these things, yet I don't claim the office of the prophet. Because through the eyes of the person of the Christ, the future it's not a mystery. Through the visions of Christ, these experiences come. And some we see in full, some we see in part. But you can tell that a man at least has had a glimpse of that reality. And you can tell when he starts speaking certain things. Hmm, this connects to something that you are speaking to your servant. This is not only for Apostle Grace. This is for every believer who says, I believe God. That wisdom is available. Because why? Godly skillful and godly wisdom, he says, when you find it, your future is sure. All right? But that skillful and godly wisdom now is in the person of Jesus Christ. He has spoken through Christ. The Bible says, who has been made our wisdom? The Bible says, Corinthians 1.30, he says, Jesus Christ, whom of God has been made unto us wisdom. Okay? In another part of the Bible, he says, in him is hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In who? In the person of Jesus Christ. Now you have Jesus. You know your future. I know what's going to happen after this. Yeah, I know what's going to happen after this season for the believer, or at least for me who has the wisdom, and for those of you who believe with me. When there's a casting down, there's going to be a rising up. So what do I expect after COVID? Furniture is going to grow. I'm going to be elevated as a man of God. How do you know? Yeah. And this can go even more distinct to the words he spoke to me if I spoke those words on the 31st or to the words he spoke to me when he was calling me or to the things that he has spoken to me that touch my call that become distinct. It can go so deep there to justify. All right? I know that I'm going to be richer. <laughs> Glory to God. I know that I'm going to see a harvest like I've never seen before. Glory to God. I know that I'm going upward. Glory to God. I know that I'm going to be healthy. Glory to God. I know things are going to shift and many doors are going to open in Europe, in America, and the world than they have ever been opened before. Glory to God. I know that this video, somebody one day will find it and say, oh my God, this guy spoke these words in this season. I know it. Glory to God. So I'm asking you, what do you know about your future? And so if you understand this, how can you worry? 
about next month and next week and next year and next uh, you know and, and i sometimes i hear men of god who are you know going around this and that and you know some of them are already scared and putting fear in the hearts of people for no reason listen christ is not dead but when our eyes are off the christ all right something starts to glare in our spirits that takes us off the mind of god our visions start to you know become hazy and our future starts to become bleak but mine is clear and so is yours who's watching me this very hour now i want to pray with you right now i just want you to raise your voice just raise your voice and talk to jesus just talk to jesus just talk to Jesus. Get everything you know in the Word to be true and throw it there as a confirmation of what is already affirmed in your spirit, touching your future. Tell your future now. Tell your future. Speak your next year. Speak your next two years. By the time God brings a prophet or an evangelist or an apostle, you already know your future by the chief prophet chief apostle jesus christ come and speak look to him my brother lead. look to jesus now and leave it recorded in his word hallelujah it is only the truth and me. Look at me, my brother. Look to Jesus now and me. It's recorded. Hallelujah, it's only that you look and me. Whatever his word says is true to you today as it was yesterday. Everything he has said is here and in you. Your future is brighter. Your next week is brighter. Your next year is brighter. Your next coming year is brighter. I'm excited for what's going to happen in this period. I see that God is planning out something for the believer. He's weaving a very uh, special script and story for every believer watching me right now. And I declare and I declare, whether you slept hungry yesterday, whether your business is under watch, whatever is happening right now, whether you are sick right now in the world, you probably somebody's watching me. And I've had cases of people who have been suffering from COVID. I also received a praise report this morning of a person who has been suffering with COVID in the U.S. The guy sent me a message. His father's been tuning in and they're discharging the man. He's been healed. The Lord has healed him and there's been no pain, no nothing. God has just seen the man through in divine health. I believe right now that the sick are getting healed right now, whether COVID, HIV, cancer, whatever disease is in your body, because your future has been destined by Christ to be glorified. I believe in the name of Jesus that your finances are being fixed, your marriages are being fixed, your children are being fixed, your health is being fixed, your ministries are being fixed, pastors that are watching right this very hour. I know that there's been a spell, you know, of not meeting and congregating and some of you are worried where you're going to begin from, but I have a good news for you that it's going to be better. You're going to run faster than you have ever run before and this works for those who believe in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and all stand fast. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I say, you know what? After this broadcast, I believe I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In a minute, just repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word tonight. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 
or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.